Okay, so this is a presentation about the middle cauldron. Um, there are three cauldrons and we've already done a kind of discussion on the first two. And if you go onto the Owen Grove YouTube channel, you'll find um, videos that the first one is the three cauldrons overview. And that's about an hour just talking about the three cauldrons and how they relate to other systems uh, around the world, really. Um, so I'm very keen on taking wisdom and insight from any culture that sheds light on the three cauldrons. Although at the end of this presentation, I will return to the Irish source material, which is a 14th century manuscript. Um, that's explained on the YouTube clip of the Three Cauldrons Overview. So the history of that is there. And there's a, a video about an hour just for the lower cauldron. And there's also a video for about an hour of the upper cauldron. So this is the finale, if you like. This is the an hour or so for the middle cauldron. And then that's a complete set on the YouTube channel. Um, after this, uh, I probably won't do much on the three cauldrons uh, on Zoom or YouTube for a while, but I am going to muck around with various Qigong ideas, which just in fun, I'm calling tree gung because of the metaphors that are used in Taoist teachings about rooting your energy and, and expanding like a tree, reaching for the stars and all of that kind of thing. They, they, they use a lot of tree metaphors for teaching qigong. So being oem and being a bit druidic, saying tree gun is a bit, bit of fun, you know, and I'm going to take elements out of that kind of Chinese wisdom that I think are beneficial to modern Druids and, and Wiccans and witches and pagans and all the rest of it. You know, not everybody wants to learn martial arts or, or Tai Chi or, or Qigong, you know, but, but if there's something useful, like posture correction and breathing methods that help to invigorate the three cauldrons, it's worth playing with, worth exploring, you know. And I've also got ideas of how once you work with yourself energetically in that way, you can go into the forest and breathe with trees of your choice as a kind of medicine, like um, the bark flower remedies or flower essences, you know, so that there's a way of holding yourself and breathing slowly and sharing energy so that you could get the medicine of oak tree or holly tree or hawthorn tree you know by by breathing in a focused and intelligent way and making that rooted connection with the tree that you're sitting under or standing under so that, that's all in the future so um <clears throat> the three cauldrons then I, further on in this little presentation i'm going to show some images that help shed light on some of the things I'm saying. Um, but before I do that, I'm gonna give a kind of general discussion and then the pictures will kind of uh, recap some of the things that I've said. So uh, the middle cauldron then, one way of approaching it is from the classical world, uh, ancient Greek, Rome, Alexandria, <coughs> even Egypt. Um, where uh, the signs of the zodiac correspond to different parts of the body, uh, an anatomical uh, astrology. For instance, um, the head is governed by Aries and the neck is governed by Taurus, you know? So each of the 12 signs governs a part of your body. Now, what's really interesting is that the three fire signs, and fire is usually a metaphor for internal heat or spirit or chi, or the Druids would say nuuvra. Um, but the three fire signs are 
the three cauldrons. And that's really interesting. And, and they relate to how it works in Chinese Taoist alchemical ideas as well. But simplistically then, the three fire signs are Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius. Now, Aries governs the head, the upper cauldron. So symbolically, every one of us, male and female, have ram horns because Aries governs the head, you know, and it's the spring equinox, Aries the ram, you know, so that shining light at dawn or, or on spring equinox, it, it's got all those ideas of the radiant light forehead. Leo, and this we'll talk about a bit, um, because Leo is your middle cauldron, Leo governs the heart, okay, you know, and the heart is the middle cauldron. Um, in Kabbalistic studies, you know, like the tree of life uh, represents a human figure, and the central Sephiroth is Tifereth, which is the sun at the center, you know, and, and that's Leo, the sun. Leo is the only sign of the zodiac governed by the sun, you know, so the sunshine is in your heart because Leo governs the heart. Sagittarius is the third fire sign and it governs the thighs. And that might seem a bit strange at first. Just let someone in. <clears throat> but thighs, from a Chinese Taoist alchemical perspective, generate the chi, the internal energy, the heat, the fire within, is governed by your thighs and the way you stand. So I was saying about qi gung, posture and and activating your thighs, really important. The Chinese have this idea that the heart pumps the blood around the body, okay, which it does. But more esoterically, they have this idea that the kidneys pump or energy around the body. Now it's your thighs predominantly that drive and power up that kidney production you know so it's um running up and down your legs are your kidney channel you know so tai chi and qigong uh they activate the kidney channel which puts chi in your lower cauldron it's like powering up your battery building up your immune system <clears throat> anyway back to the zodiacal stuff so leo governs the heart and we're coming up to that soon. We're in the last few days of Vine, and Vine is completely the sign of Cancer the Crab. And on Tuesday, we go into the days of Ivy, and Ivy will take us from Cancer the Crab into Leo the Lion. So we're about soon, you know, in a week or two, we'll be going into Leo, the heart, the middle cauldron, the, the central sphere, if you like. Now, every sign of the zodiac has secondary constellations. So if you look at me, and there's a kind of white circle around me, uh, and the signs of the zodiac uh, are just on that outer rim. If you were looking at the stars in the night sky, they're like a circle. The, the zodiac signs and that circle is called the ecliptic and it's the the path that the sun appears to do throughout the year go around this circle um, but inside that circle are many other constellations many other constellations you know all of them so if you saw that white circle as a cake and cut it into 12 slices of cake each slice of cake is governed by a zodiac sign. So there's a Cancer the Crab piece of cake and a Leo the Lion piece of cake. But within that piece of cake, there's other constellations. Do you understand? So the piece of cake for Leo the Lion has other constellations. And the, the main one for Leo is a very, very important constellation for ancient mystery traditions. And it's there in the Welsh bardic tradition and in the irish bardic tradition and it's called crater now it's not a, a a crater on the moon a, a crater is a wine mixing 
cup or bowl or basin or vessel. So it's a wine mixing vessel. Now this, think about this then, you know, so Leo governs the heart and with it comes this sacred vessel for mixing wine in it. You know, this wine mixing vessel was used in the ancient mystery rites and traditions, possibly with um, hallucinogenics and, and other things to give people visions and so on, but not always, you know, some cultures do it differently, but some would use mushrooms and herbs and, and other things, you know. Um, it seems that the, the Greek generalism was a concoction of vine vine, wine, and ivy. Now, ivy is slightly mind-altering, and of course vine and ivy are side by side in the oem. And the next tree that we come to after ivy is broom, and broom is crater, the wine mixing basin, you know. So it's very suggestive, the oem of a bardic mystery rite that this time of year you get the vine, you get the ivy that helps to alter the mentality, and then you get the goddess with the sacred heavenly grail uh, wine mixing bowl, you know, that's all there. <clears throat> Followed by blackthorn and elder and, and broom, blackthorn and elder have all this Virgo stuff, which is mystery tradition stuff as well, I might touch on that a little bit. Um, in the ancient world, uh, Virgo was the great goddess and um, she was uh, Demeter, Demeter, um, and she was also Ceres. And in the Welsh law, she's Ceres Ceredwin, Ceredwin, it's the same goddess really, you know, she consumes Gwion back at Lunasa because nine months after he's born at Beltane, you know, so that makes Ceredwin this Virgo goddess, you know, thing. So that's a really interesting thing because Broom, the grail maiden with Crater, the wine mixing cup, she's the what would you say, the bride at Lunasa, just like Keridwen, for, you know, a child consumed on that Lunasa night is going to be born at Beltane, like Taliesin, you know, so it's this time of year. And that kind of rite of passage or uh, taking an initiate into a mystery tradition and then they're reborn as an initiated radiant brow at Beltane, this is that time. And so these vine, ivy, broom, uh, Virgo stuff, you know, and so even uh, with the Virgo goddess, the, the sign of Virgo is shared by three trees and they're the triple goddess in this Owen Grove pattern. The first one is broom, and a grail maiden. Um, and the second one is Virgo, is Blackthorn, the goddess herself. And the third one goes from Virgo into Libra, and Libra is the scales. The scales in Egyptian tradition weigh the heart. You know, there's a whole load of Egyptian artwork of the heart being weighed after death. You know, so as soon as you go into an initiatory rite, you're in a way, symbolically, you die to the old you. The old you dies at the moment you enter an initiation. And so the very first thing that comes in the, in the sequence of the Oem after Demeter Ceres Keridwen is the elder, the grandmother. And she's got this, you know, she's the washer at the forge. She's going to weigh your heart. Uh, before you carry on with the, the scales of Libra, that heart weighing thing is there. So again, it's all kind of singing of this middle cauldron, 
you know. So you've got Leo governing the heart, you've got a celestial cauldron with Leo, and then at the end of Virgo, you've got the weighing of the heart before any of the initiatory mysticism happens. You know, that's the beginning, if you like, of the descent into the darkness of winter and the rebirth and then the rising in the spring to Beltane. And it's the kind of pattern that's being sung there. Now, <clears throat> there's a fascinating pattern, star law pattern. I'll just talk about that for a couple of minutes. It's called the Royal Star Cross. There's, and it's called that because there's four royal stars. Okay, you can think of them as being 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, uh, 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock. You know, it's just an uh, equal armed cross. So if you think of a cross like that, and at the top of the cross is usually depicted as Aquarius. And the four royal stars are Fomal Ho of Aquarius and Tares of Scorpio, uh, Aldebaran of Taurus and Regulus of Leo. But the main things that are important right now is that the, the upright part of the cross has Aquarius at the top and Aquarius is the water pourer, you know, the water carrier is always depicted pouring water. So there's water being poured down the cross, if you like. And at the bottom of the cross opposite Aquarius is Leo. And with Leo is the heavenly cauldron, the grail, the wine mixing cup. So at the foot of the cross is this sacred vessel catching the water or fluids that are descending from the cross. Now, that was used in our theory and legends with Joseph of Arimathea collecting the blood of Jesus at the Holy, into the cup of the Holy Grail from, from the crucifixion and all that sort of stuff, but it's star law, it's old star law, you know. Now, think about it this way too then. So from a Celtic perspective, we are entering the, age of Aquarius, the whole world is, whether you're, whether it's Celtic or not, you know, the whole, the planet is entering the age of Aquarius. But from a Celtic perspective, Aquarius is the goddess Brigid, Bridie, Brigantia, because the midpoint of Aquarius is the festival of Imbolc. The Imbolc is the main festivity of the goddess Bridie, Brigid, Brigantia. So think about this then, for the next two and a half thousand years, from a Celtic perspective, Aquarius Bridey is pouring the heavenly waters into the wine mixing bowl inside everybody's middle cauldron. Because Leo governs the heart, you know, so for every living creature on the planet, their heart is going to be filled up with this Bridey, Bridget, Brigantia, Aquarian age waters descending into the sacred vessel of Leo at the foot of the cross. That's really important, you know. So on the one hand, the middle cauldron is about you as an individual and your vocation and how to live your life but on a grander scale for the next two and a half thousand years every living creature on the planet is going to be receiving aquarian age waters into their middle cauldron <laughs> you know that's the star law of that and that's quite amazing really that big shift from what would you say abrahamic patriarchal religions to this return of divine feminine literally piercing everybody's heart, but not with a spear, these healing waters. Probably the most important thing about the middle cauldron. But then you come back to uh, how to work with it from your own perspective within yourself then. So the shifting from the star law then to the Taoist alchemical practices. And this is just some insights that I have. I started learning Tai Chi back in the year 2000 
so it's 22 years ago now and, and I'm, I don't know everything of course um, but I've picked up quite a few insights along the way especially to do with qigong. Now qigong might sound exotic and, and alien to some people but it's just Chinese literally for energy work that's all it means. Qi is just energy and gung means work so it's energy work or energy exercises but it's your in, it's your life force it's your intrinsic energy you know um if you look to my right no that way but for me it's like a mirror image it's a bit strange but the yin yang symbol here um this is the middle cauldron now if i just shift the bottom cauldron is the black circle that's yin and yin is heavy and it always sinks downwards and the top circle is yang and it's light and it always rises up it's kind of its nature the, the polarity opposites but one sinks one rises one's dense one is light um, one is physical and one is non-physical um, i'll explain that in a minute but the middle cauldron is the meeting of the two and that meeting of the two happens in your heart center you know now this is where it will help with the irish name for the middle cauldron translates as the cauldron of vocation and what is the word vocation what does that mean well, i'll come to that in a minute but before I do, I'll talk a little bit about the, the yin and yang. Um, first of all, this middle circle, the yin and yang circle, the heart center, the Chinese call it xin, and it's spelt in English X-I-N, pronounced xin. And it's a brilliant word. It just means heart mind the mind of the heart, the heart mind, very different to the brain mind, okay? The brain mind is, is a computer. It works things out and it's the sun and the moon. It's, it's knowing and reflective consciousness. But the middle cauldron is your heart mind. And this is what's very important about it. Um, things get lost in translation especially with the Chinese stuff coming into England, um, mainly because we've had 2000 years of Christianity, uh, things get confusing. So simplistically, at the beginning, according to the Taoists, there was nothing, there was a great nothingness, you know, that's common amongst most cultures. Um, and then there was yin and yang. And, and as soon as there's yin and yang, there's interplay of many things are born of, of this interplay of duality, if you like. Now, yin and yang, here's the mistranslation. Yin and yang are often described as heaven and earth. And it's not, it, it's not because from a European Western perspective, heaven, is loaded with Christian concepts. Okay, so it's not heaven in a biblical understanding. Okay, and it's not earth either. You know, so, so here's a clearer uh, explanation of what yin and yang are that they're called the great ultimates. And yin, earth, isn't earth or mud or planet earth it's physical manifestation so every single distant galaxy star planet is earth it's all physical manifestation understand yeah so anything that's physical and material is yin the earth so the yang the heaven isn't a place where Jesus and God are, heaven or yang is the non-physical, you know, the non-physical, the spirit world, the, the, 
however you can get your brain around it you know we're all going to be clutching at straws trying to get our heads around the non-physical you know but that's really what yin and yang mean so and both and this does your head in as well both are infinite you know the, the, the physical universe expanding outwards is infinite you know what's it expanding into all those kind of questions you know and the non-physical is infinite as well eternal so then philosophically all of us are that and in our middle cauldron in our center we are yin and yang we are our physical self and our non-physical eternal self that's all middle cauldron you know if i go sideways a bit you can see the diagram behind me so that the middle cauldron is radiating it's a bit like the film et when his heart light is shining red if you like you know and that if you were a ball of energy that middle cauldron is like the nucleus of your atom it's the center point of your of who you are and it, and it's the marriage between your eternal self and your physical incarnation at this moment in time okay now the lower cauldron and the upper cauldron are extensions if you like of the middle cauldron it's like the upper cauldron is a periscope that comes upwards and looks around and, and the lower cauldron holds you and, and your energy and your chi and your immune system and all of that kind of thing, you know. But it's your heart mind, your heart center, where you are at, really. Now, the physical body is perishable. Of course it is. We're mortal. Our bodies are mortal and the bodies will die. So even your brain will perish away. But your eternal self is eternal and it's there in your heart mind. So it's why it's so important for well being to get out of your head, to get out of your fear, stress, anxiety, worry, get out of all of that and come down to your middle cauldron and just feel and just be and just breathe and be alive you know that's all there that's the middle cauldron it's it's your connection to your eternal self now um there are various breathing exercises for health and well-being that meditation helps with making that connection to your middle cauldron and that's what i'll do in the future i'll, I'll do some simple tree gung uh, Qigong video clips just to help with that, just to help get out of your head and into your heart a, a little bit. And then you take that knowledge to the woods. You know, find an oak tree, find a holly tree, whatever you're drawn to, and just make that connection because a tree is a physical body and an eternal spirit as well. All living things are, you know, <clears throat> they're just a different kind of breathing creature but it's a living thing just like we are so everything that's living is yin and yang physical and non-physical so <clears throat> yeah what i'm going to try and do now then is before we get into the middle cauldron and what vocation is um, i'm going to show you some diagrams just to help recap some of the things i said so I'm going to try and share and flick through a PowerPoint thing with pictures. <clears throat> Probably do that on there. Okay. Um, Right. So here's a basic diagram. <clears throat> uh, this is an idealized concept. So the Irish material 
describes the lower cauldron for everybody as being upright. And it, you know, from a Taoist perspective, it holds your life force, really. Uh, for the average person, the life force is going to last about 70 or 80 years. It's kind of like your battery. And when it runs out, it's time to go. Sort of thing. So the, the Taoist alchemists studied different ways of boosting that battery to try and have longevity, to have a long life. You know, so a lot of that stuff is about topping up the battery so that you can live to 90 or 100. You know, I've seen YouTube clips of old Taoist guys waving swords around at 110. You know, they are there on YouTube to see these things. Um, but simplistically, it's your it's your well-being, it's your life force. And um, it's powered by working your thighs, Sagittarius, the lower cauldron fire sign. Exercising in a gentle way that generates heat from your thighs is going to boost your white blood cells and boost your immune system. That's just a simple thing to begin with, you know. Um, yeah, the middle cauldron, from the Irish perspective, for most people, is depicted on its side, and it can, from, from being on its side, it can flip upwards or downwards, depending on whether you are joyful or sad, or broken. You know, you could be devastated by the death of a loved one, so you're going to be broken hearted. So your middle cauldron is going to turn upside down, whilst you're broken hearted, until you can get your emotions in you and your heart back together. Um, but if you can turn it upwards, then it can activate the upper cauldron. Now for everybody, apparently, in the Irish manuscript, for everybody, apart from the very enlightened bards, people like the Dalai Lama or, or whatever, the cauldron is upside down, the upper cauldron is upside down. So the idea is if you can work on your middle cauldron, if you can figure out your vocation and work with your vocation and turn it upright, then the upper cauldron turns upright. And when the upper cauldron is upright, it can receive divine knowledge, inspired poetry. You know, Franklin has a brilliant phrase of fire in the head, and, and it is, it's just like a constant download of inspiration. So I've used the druidic symbol of the R one there, you know, but it's taliesing with his radiant brow or any charismatic teacher, you know, but it's not a perpetual state either. As soon as you're broken hearted, the upper cauldron is going to turn upside down and turn off again. And, and, and in that moment, you have to work on your emotional stuff, you know. So that's that simple idea there. So this figure has all three cauldrons activated and is receiving inspiration. <clears throat> this one, really important. This is, uh, although it's Roman, it's not really Roman because it's a Persian mystery tradition that was practiced in Britain. This is from Hadrian's Wall you know, from uh, fourth century Britain. This predates any written material about Bardic mystery schools. You know, this is on Hadrian's wall before Taliesin was living and breathing. Now, the reason I've put it here is because it shows kind of universal star law for that period of time. Um, and what's really interesting, if you look at the top of the head of the figure in the middle, you've got the moon for Cancer the Crab and the sun for Leo the Lion. Now, that represents the left-hand side of the brain and the right-hand side of the brain, or the logic and the dreamer, or the reflective mind and the all-knowing mind. But either, either way you work with it, that's where we are at this moment in time, or we're coming to it in the days of Ivy, the days of ivy take us to that moment between the sun and the moon. If you like, it's the central column of planetary chakras up and down the spinal cord, if you like, you know. Um, 
in the old days, they only had seven planets. They didn't know about Uranus and, and Neptune and, and so on, or Pluto. So they had the sun and the moon, and then they had uh, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn. So they had to share those seven planets around the 12 signs of the zodiac. And the way they did it is quite interesting. At the very bottom, you've got um, Capricorn and Aquarius are governed by Saturn. And that's your lower cauldron. There's also midwinter, okay? And then coming up to the kind of, what would you call it, the solar plexus area, you've got Jupiter. And Jupiter is governed by Sagittarius and Pisces. And then you have Mars, which is Scorpio and Aries. And then you have Venus, which is Taurus and Libra. And then just above Mithras's forehead, you've got Mercury, which is Gemini and Virgo, you know. And then at the very top, Cancer, the moon, and Leo, lion, so the sun. The interesting thing with this figure, and so many things really, it's amazing. You know, like a Jesus is referred to as the Alpha and the Omega, which means the beginning and the end, because they're the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Look at the circle around Mithras. It's not just a circle, it's a great big Omega. You know, so here he is as a kind of Lord of the Heavens, long before Britain had become Christian. And he's got a big Omega, like he's the all of everything, the end of everything, the, or the, the great Omega is the great big O. So the O is like the everything within that great big O. It's like the yin and yang within a circle in a way. You know. Now here's some clever stuff. His sword points to the summer solstice. The summer solstice is the cusp between Gemini and Cancer the Crab. And in his other hand, he's holding a torch. And the torch is the cusp between Leo and Virgo, you know, and, and this is why, you know, goddesses like Hecate are depicted holding torches is because of the descent into the mystery traditions. You know, you need a torch to light your way as you go down into the mysteries and you go down into the darkness of the year until the rebirth at winter solstice. So a lot of the cauldron stuff from the middle cauldron is about broom being the grail maiden at lunasa and she's right there where he's holding the torch between virgo and leo that's broom you know she's the first aspect of the triple goddess of virgo and she's gonna take the initiate down into the mysteries but she's holding the constellation of crater the wine mixing cup as well the Leo maiden, the Grail maiden, broom. This is the same thing from, I, I took the thing from uh, Hadrian's wall then. So if you look at the top, it's Cancer and Leo. You know, I've just used that same uh, diagram way of having the planetary chakras, but I've stripped that away a little bit and I've thought more shamanically, but in a kind of Celtic Druidic way. So the upper world, the middle world and the lower world, are that as well. They're your three cauldrons, you know, and, and the lower cauldron in Chinese stuff is called the sea, as in ocean, the sea of qi. It's the great infinite endless supply of spiritual water, if you like. Remember, um, the, yeah, the, you know, the middle cauldron being filled up by the waters of the, the Aquarian age sort of thing. So, from a bardic perspective, the salmon of wisdom are there in the lower cauldron. And um, Pisces and Aquarius are the salmon weir in the star law of Keridwin and Taliesin. You know, Pisces is the salmon weir. Um, the middle world is your middle cauldron. I've put the white heart there, the stag, you know, it's the king of the woods. And, and uh, so it fits nicely. And for the upper world, I've put the eagle. You know, it's kind of a nod. I mean, the eagle is the biggest bird of the sky world anyway. It's often great spirit in many traditions, although the swan can, can be that too. But the eagle at the top is also a nod to fly, uh, being a wounded eagle to come back down to earth, if you like. Um, 
but it's also just an illustration of the three worlds uh, and how they fit to the fit shamanically to the three cauldrons. Here's a demonstration of the age of Aquarius and the waters pouring into crater the wine mixing cup. So this is the royal star cross. The shaded areas are the four royal stars. That's why it's called the royal star cross. And we're transitioning right now between the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius. So that diagonal line is where planet Earth is right now. And we'll be going through the age of Aquarius for the next two, two and a half thousand years. So that internal grail in everyone's middle cauldron is going to be filled from a Celtic perspective by Bridie Bridget Brigantia. She's the goddess of Aquarius in bulk. Quick diagram of the Taoist ideas. <clears throat> but um, if you look down by his groin area, you've got the black circle for yin, physicality. And the lower cauldron there is kind of the base cauldron for all of the internal alchemy that is cooking within. And there's also a diagram of energy rising up the spinal cord through three different gateways. So there's a gateway at different places in the spine that correspond with the lower cauldron, the middle cauldron and the upper cauldron. So I'll talk about those three gateways when I do some tree gung videos. <clears throat> at the heart there's a flaming heart that you know it's the that's where the fire of spirit is it's in the heart mind not the head you know the the head is perishable and the chinese call it the sea of marrow you know like the gray stuff is just marrow that's all it is you know um, they do rate the pineal gland very highly and it's almost like the gray stuff is padding or protection around the pineal gland, if you like. So this is my diagram for uh, trying to encompass all of it, really. The three cauldrons of the Irish Celtic system, the Taoist alchemical ideas, the tree has the lower world, middle world, upper world ideas, but they're all doing the same thing. They're all trying to get your energy body aligned your mortal self and your and your eternal self unified and really at the middle cauldron you know the main thing with vocation is that if you're not following your vocation whatever that vocation is and i can't tell you what your vocation is but only you will know if you're not following your vocation you'll never be happy you'll never be contented and so it's really important to listen to your heart mind because your heart mind is your compass from the spirit world. It's your eternal self saying yes, or it's your eternal self saying no, 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 you know, and it's so important. Now, because of financial worries in the modern world, we all often make decisions based on financial logic. You know, we've got bills to pay and, and so you make life choices that are going to give you financial security and all the rest of it. And there's nothing wrong in that. But is it the vocation that a lot of people have a midlife crisis because they've spent the first half of their life earning money, but not being true to themselves, you know, and it's going to it's going to bite you in the end, you know, uh, difficult stuff. But at least by looking within and knowing what your vocation is and what your heart wants to do, you can start walking in that direction. Even if you just do a compromise of earning money, but you know what, in the evening, I'm gonna take up classical music or dancing or whatever it is, you know, whatever your soul is calling for. If you, don't, if you don't follow your middle cauldron, your heart mind, if you don't listen to it, you're just gonna get ill. And that's really serious, you know. The brain is perishable. The brain is not your eternal self. It just worries about bills and what to do right now, but it's not your eternal self. So final diagram. If you look at the lower cauldron, there's a line going down to the ball of each foot and there's a spiral in each foot. 
So this is to do with the kidney channel and developing your immune, immune system and building up your battery. So that's about correct posture and literally just the correct posture, holding the lower cauldron. And you know what, for five minutes, 10 minutes, your thighs get a bit hot and bothered, but that's really good medicine for you. You know, not no pain, no gain. As soon as it's uncomfortable, you, you, you get out of it, you know, but you gently working your thighs is really big medicine. Okay. Now, if you look at the middle cauldron, there's two lines that come out of it and go along the arms to the hands and there's spirals on the hands. You know, this is a different channel. So your legs have the kidney channel. I couldn't draw it literally, but the, the arms have primarily the pericardium channel and the pericardium channel comes out on the surface of your body by your nipples. And it goes from your nipples up to your shoulders and then down through each arm to the fingertip of the biggest finger is your pericardium finger. But the energy whirls in the Lao Gong, the, the center of the palm. And that's really important for many reasons. You can use it for Reiki and hands-on healing. You know, you can use it for putting your palms on a tree and sharing energy with the tree. You know, they're, they're like a tree frog, literally understanding how the energy goes in and out of your palms, you know, is a big part of the tree medicine. And also twisting and rotating your arms, like Qigong ideas, uh, massages the pericardium channel. And what that does is really interesting because the pericardium is like a sheath or a sack or a bag around your heart, you know? And say that my fist is my heart like this and I put the pericardium around it. The pericardium gently squeezes ever so gently. And what that does is it calms you down. You know, acupuncture on the pericardium channel is good for insomnia and anxiety and hysteria and all of those kind of things. You know, there's something about the pericardium channel that just calms you down and relaxes you. So remember the upper cauldron out of control, worry, stress, fear, anxiety is detrimental to your health. So working with your pericardium and calming yourself down, very, very important. You know, that bring you back into your heart mind rather than your fear and worry. The upper, so the lower cauldron is driven by the legs, the middle cauldron driven by the arms. These are to do with the gates on the spinal cord. And the upper cauldron is to do with your spinal cord, your central nervous system. And when you breathe in, energy goes up your spinal cord, stimulates your pineal gland. And when you breathe out, it all settles back down into the lower cauldron. So these are ideas we'll look at in the tree gung videos. But I'll stop sharing now. Okay, so that's those diagrams. Now I'm gonna finish with the Irish material itself. Now this is the book I work from. Well, it's not gonna work with the thing. This is, um, why won't it show? Yeah, if I have it by my head, it doesn't disappear. This is by Caitlin Matthews, Caitlin Matthews and John Matthews. It's called Encyclopedia of Celtic Wisdom. And I've got a lot of time for Caitlin Matthews. Um, I think she's a very insightful, turned on person. You know, she's got really good insights to Celtic mysticism, very much so. Uh, I have met her a couple of times. Um, so there are, um, there's about four or five translations of the Irish source for the three cauldrons. Um, so Kathleen Matthews isn't the only one, uh, but it's the one that I know and it's the one that I prefer. But, but even having said that, and with all due respect to Kathleen Matthews, um, things are lost in translation, you know? So I'm gonna, I think you have to listen and read between the lines 
and um, take it from there, really, you know. So our, our, the, the source material for the free cauldrons is very little. It amounts to about four pages. That's all it is. It was a document found by accident amongst some legal papers, but it does date to the 14th century and it is genuine uh, Irish bardic law. Now, the last two pages of that are to do with the cauldron of vocation, the middle cauldron. And, and it's two poems. But of course, originally they're in Gaelic, they're not in English. So the English words that are used in the translation are always going to be debatable. You know, there's reading between the lines or getting a general fla flavour of what the original Gaelic was saying. But also the original Gaelic, 14th century, so 1300s. So if you think of the difference between Shakespearean English and modern English, it's a bigger gap. You know, the Three Cauldrons manuscript to modern Irish is a bigger gap than that Shakespearean thing. So anyway, this is Caitlin Matthews' translation. So I'm going to read the last two poems and then we'll talk about them. So I'll stop waffling on then. Um, <clears throat> I'll read it slowly so that we can listen to it again on YouTube because it's hard to take it all in and hold it in your brain. It's, it's difficult. Um, so the first poem is called The Cauldron of Vocation. And here it goes. Hear the words of Ned McAdney. The Cauldron of Vocation sings with insights of grace, with measures of knowledge, with streams of inspiration. It is an estuary of wisdom, a confluence of knowledge, a stream of dignity, and it gives exaltation to the lowly. It gives mastery of eloquence. It gives royal discernment and sovereign insight. It's a poetic lineage to cherish students. It is where laws are regulated, where meanings are recited, where musical runs are chanted, where knowledge is propagated, where the freeborn are taught, where the bound are set free, where the nameless win fame, where praise is related, by measured regulation, by distinct degrees, with pure measures of immunity, with the eloquence of sages, a confluence of scholarship, the noble brew in which is boiled, the stock of each knowledge. It is established by rote, it is enriched by diligence, it is fermented by inspiration, it is overturned by joy. It manifests through sorrow. It is an enduring power whose protection never ebbs. Thus sings the cauldron of vocation. So that's the first poem. Now, the second poem is really interesting. I didn't realize this until a few days ago. So I'm quite glad this is the second middle cauldron thing because the first one I lost internet connection. Uh, in the winter time, we'll be working on book four of the Grove Journal, uh, and book four, volume four, is about the willow tree and the nine maidens um, of Welsh bardic law. You know, so there's a poem called uh, "What's it called?" The Spoiling of Anuin credited to Taliesin, and it describes the cauldron of Anuin. Now, Anuin means inner world. So it's the cauldron of the inner world. And in the Taliesin poem, it says that it is kept warm by the breath of nine maidens. 
So there's this relationship between nine maidens and the inner cauldron, okay? Now, here's a brilliant thing. This final poem then is called The Nine Gifts of the Cauldron. So there's a direct relationship with the Taliesin cauldron of Andovin. And I went through it a few times I'll do my fingers, or I don't know if it work, I'll try and do my fingers to count that there's nine aspects that the cauldron gives. So here it goes. The nine gifts of the cauldron. The cauldron of vocation gives and is replenished, promotes and is enlarged, nourishes and is given life, ennobles and is exalted, requests and is filled with answers, sings and is filled with song, preserves and is made strong, arranges and receives arrangements, maintains and is maintained. Good is the well of measure, good is the abode of speech, good is the confluence of power, it builds up strength. It is greater than any domain. It is better than any inheritance. It numbers us among the wise and we depart from the ignorant. That's really interesting. We depart from the ignorant. Mystery traditions are about leaving your muggle self and becoming an initiated thing, you know? So departing from the ignorant implies you're going to go and become a bit more awakened in some way or another. And I'll just read what Catelyn says about that final poem. She sums it up really nicely. So just think Middle Cauldron. Uh, this poem enumerates the nine gifts of the cauldron of vocation, which may be seen as analogous to the gifts of the nine hazels of the well of Shergay, the source of all poetic inspiration. The dual function of the cauldron is clearly stated. This vessel, active within all who are aware of their creative resources, both gives out to others in the physical world and is replenished in the inner world. This is an important realization in the creative arts that the practice of one's art is not to empty oneself but to be filled again. They're so important, you know, if you're a creative person or there, whether it's artwork, music, writing, whatever, you know, the more you produce, the more you get. It somehow it just keeps filling and filling and filling. But anyway, I'll keep recording, but I'll stop talking now. You can put your microphones on and we'll chat. Hmm. Quite a lot there, wasn't there? Oh. Good things come to those who wait. Wow. That was awesome. Thank you for keeping the meeting open, Yui. I um I had difficult oh there's an echo somewhere. That might be manners uh, Um I had difficulty getting into Zoom I had to reboot my whole laptop. So thank you. I thought I was gonna miss it. Um and something you said um, earlier about you would stop waffling. I don't think you ever waffle. <laughs> um, and yeah, there was, so I'm sorry I missed the first sort of talk an hour. Um, what I, it's just such a wealth of information. It's just lovely. Thank you. It's, um, yeah, there's a lot to take in. And I'll it's, stop speaking now because it seems to be going a bit, a bit weird. There's weird background sound. Yeah, Manna, can can you turn your microphone off unless you're talking? Thank you. Put your, Is that better? Yeah, it's Manna's microphone for some oh. reason. Oh, um, yeah. There was just another comment uh, when you were talking about moving into the age of Aquarius and all the the Bridget energy coming through, and it just struck me whether that is part of the sort of world uh, recognizing women 
and you know women's rights and where women are oppressed I mean and all the things I mean I know there's a, a lot, lot of stuff going on in the world but especially when you look back at these sort of um the first strands of the suffragette movement and then um you know we've had a um a female monarch you know for the longest time ever and you know with things happening to do with women's rights and everything and i'm just wondering whether that is just the sort of physical evidence of some of that bridged energy coming through it, it when you were speaking i just thought oh yeah but I, and i also hadn't heard all that explanation about the yin and yang before so that was really interesting thank you yeah lovely information as ever thank you no, I agree with everything you've just said as well, you know, um, and it's about time. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I don't um, know if you can, I don't know if you can hear me or not, yeah. <clears throat> but when you were giving your talk, uh, the, the, the term human came to mind. Because in Vedic tradition, hue is like celestial or God, and man is considered body. So to become a human is to have this balance between the celestial mind and the earthly body. And when I, when I learned that, I felt like that was just you know, that's what this is, is it's this constant dance of keeping our balance or rebalancing ourselves, maybe not always being in that perfect balance, but witnessing that balance. And I forget what it was you were talking about. I think a lot had a lot to do with when you started talking about the, the yin and the yang, you know, the celestial mind and the earthly bodies of whatever it may be. I really appreciated that. Thank you. It can be overly simple and easy to criticize the idea of reincarnation. And, and I, I'm not going to, you know, I think there's many metaphysical possibilities of reincarnation. I'm not, um, but certainly, however you get your brain around it, the continuation of self after you die is something that the Celts believed in. You know, the earliest evidence about them is written by Julius Caesar. And, and although he's got political reasons to tell propaganda his way, one of the things he says is a complaint. And he complains that the Druids taught uh, the continuation of the self or trans transmigration of the soul or something. And he complains about it because he says it makes the Celtic warriors fearless and reckless. They don't care about dying. And that was a pain in his ass, you know. Um, so he actually grumbles about their belief in an afterlife or, or whatever, you know. So we don't know what the Druids taught, but the, the evidence is there that they believed in the continuation of the self, you know. So at its simplest <laughs> level Taoism yin and yang is just that all of us are mortal and immortal you know and and then with the Owen Grove and stuff I in my brain I think uh Oak King and Holly King are metaphors for your eternal self and your mortal self you know in all of us man and woman it doesn't matter you know it's just a it's a way of teaching about your double nature you are flesh and bone and your brain will perish but you are eternal as well and somehow the middle cauldron holds that so let's again how do you work with the middle cauldron that's why i said it's a lifetime journey you know and but the the first step is finding out why you incarnated you know what is your vocation? Why did you come here? And are you doing what you came to do? And if not, you're not going to be happy because your soul is going to be not contented. Big stuff, really. Yeah. You know, you're going to speak on the Ivy right on the 19th. Yes. 
Yeah, because you know, I, I was I was wondering why is the IV? I'm I'm wondering why the uh, IV is Leo. It it trans IV transitions from Cancer to Leo. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just grows because <laughs> it yeah. just keeps so, on growing. <laughs> Well, yeah, it does, but you know, it has 18 degrees of the ecliptic. Okay. Yeah, you know, like each zodiac sign has 30 degrees, each tree has 18 degrees. So the 18 degrees of the sun's ecliptic for Ivy transition from Cancer the Crab into Leo the Lion. So Ivy is the only tree in the Oam Grove that is moon and sun, which is that central point. It's interesting, isn't it? You know, and it's really a tree. Why is it? Well, say tree, it's a shrub or, or whatever, you know. They're not all trees, they're the sh right, shrub. shrubbery, right? The broom, like broom. Mm. Okay, well, that's interesting. And that, you know, Elizabeth, that that day of transition from Cancer the Crab to Leo the Lion is the 22nd of July. That's Mary Magdalene's feast day. Yeah, I know. I always look at that, the, yeah. the sun and the moon, yeah. So that's kind of French medieval mystery traditions, a lot of that Mary Magdalene cult, you know, but it's that, that, that moment as well, that central moment, you know, and then from there, you know, then you're entering Leo, crater the wine mixing cup and descending into the mystery tradition and that's when Keridwen swallowed Gui on the back as a grain of wheat and then nine months later he's born at Beltane you know so all of this acma of vine ivy broom blackthorn elder is mystery tradition driven I think you know I think the evidence is there and um fascinating you know mm, but yeah. broom holds the you know Le broom holds leo and the constellation of crater the wine mixing cup so broom is the grail maiden in that way or she, you know from a medieval french grail christian thing she's mary magdalene and and jesus you know she's the bride you know jesus turning the water into wine is um you know it's part of that mystery rites stuff before a sacred marriage isn't it you know so it gets played out in the star law there mm, thank you that's awesome does everybody know everyone know what their vocations are no. <laughs> well, yes, because I now, because I had very much, um, you know, worked for a corporation for 30 odd years to pay bills and pay the mortgage and everything. And then um, uh, I hadn't been happy for years. And then in 2008, um, I got very sick and had to leave work. And thankfully, thank you, Universe and Modern Medicine and me, um, got a lot better. And then started doing a lot of volunteering at lovely looking after the earth, you know, lovely places. And then felt there was something missing that I wasn't utilizing. And then I'd gone for three different tarot readings in the space of a couple of years. And the first one, amongst other things, told me I was a healer. And I thought, oh, he's just being kind, because this was soon after my mum died. And then the second one, which was a few 2017, I was on a psychic development workshop. And one of the things he told me was, oh, you're a healer. And then I had a, a tower reading locally from a wonderful shaman. And he told me I was a healer. And I thought, you know what, that's three. So that's what then sent me off the road via Obod and the Touchstone magazine to learning Reiki and uh, crystals and tarot as a form of therapy and I'm happy so I mean I do you know a bit of painting as well but yeah it really felt like it, it took a hell of a long time for me to turn my mind off because I'd always been very interested in well all of this um, but hadn't realized that I had that ability to do healing stuff as well so um, yeah it's uh, 
I think some people find it quite early on if they're very fortunate, but the majority of people seems to hit them later on. But I guess everyone's journey is very different. So certainly I feel very content um, and amazed by, you know, Reiki and healing and things um, and energy work generally. So, yeah, it took me a while, but got there in the end. What I'm about to say isn't a criticism of anybody. I, I say it with heartfelt compassion, but an awful lot of people do not have a clue what their vocation is. I know, and it's so but, sad. And that's one of the things I like doing with Reiki and tarot therapy particularly. It's not only because it's something I can contribute, but if it helps push gently someone in their direction towards greater fulfillment, then that's what what better thing can there be than that really the the simple first step yeah. to, to finding your vocation if you don't know what it is is to just spend some time a week doing what you love simple mm -hmm. as that you know and it will lead you somewhere if you just have one evening a week doing what you love even if it's stamp collecting or train spotting it doesn't yeah. matter you know be in a place where your heart is content you know, and the medicine that that gives you will open up to a, a dialogue between your brain and your heart mind, you know. And but if you're just in your brain and you're not listening to your heart mind, how will you find your vocation? No, you, you won't. And, and, so, and I also love gardening. So I love helping the earth and being around trees. And I was struck by what you were saying about the, you know, when you're using your thighs gently well of course a lot of that if you're close to the ground and then you're pushing yourself up or if you're raking or scything or digging or just walking around in nature that's exactly what you're doing so um yeah i was thinking of um gardening when you were saying that gardening how you're walking brilliant yeah. absolutely yeah. So with the tree gung things, you know, there, there's lots of meditation techniques where you can lie down and risk falling asleep or sit upright in a chair, you know. But even if you're if you're lying down and sitting upright in a chair, you're not activating your thighs, you know. Mm -hmm. So from a Taoist perspective, you should be standing and meditating, you know, because oh, uh, then you're working all three cauldrons if you like you're, you're holding a posture which you know for five minutes ten minutes will get your thighs a bit warm you know but then it's only five or ten minutes and you carry on being what normal you know and then you're just breathing slowly so your heart and lungs are expanding with deep quality breath rather than <sighs> localized in the throat but proper belly breathing slowly and then just relaxing the mind, you know, no fear or worry, just peace for five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, and then you, then all three cauldrons are harmonious, you know, and, and you come out of your worry mind into your heart mind and feel. Dan dancing as well. Dancing. I think when you're dancing, I went on a, a lovely healing retreat uh, two or three weeks ago, and a lot of that was to do, getting into touch with body movement and just checking in with your body and then moving. What does your body want? Not a pretty dance, but what what actually is your body telling you to do? And it was incredibly powerful and just so simple. And then we had other dances as well. But um, yeah, that felt I'm trying to do that more often each day is sort of when circumstances allow, which is a fair number of days for me, is just tuning in. Thank you, Marco you know, which bits are tense and what needs moving and um, starting from that perspective rather than a, what have I got to do today? But sometimes it, it turning the volume down on my mind takes longer <laughs> than other days, like it does for everybody, I guess. And, and also, you know, like a, it doesn't have to be great fear or worry or, or anything, you know, but like a, a tired mind, tilters towards depression mm -hmm. and um, just because it's tired and fed up you know and then and with that you can fall into apathy and lethargic 
not doing anything but just sitting there watching TV. You know, you're just brain dead for the evening watching whatever's on. And, and that's part of a mental sadness, really. You know, it's not something, it's not something you're doing that you love that gives you positive mm -hmm. energy, you know, because you've enjoyed doing that. You know, well, you that's might have, you might have enjoyed a film, but you know what I mean? Too, too many evenings are just, bleh, you know, they're not. It's really sorry it's really interesting you saying that because the last few months I've started you know being able to entertain healing clients again both um, hands-on and distant and I've watched hardly any TV oh, I've watched a bit of Wimbledon so I like a bit of tennis but I've I've found I've been reading more and I just think and I I my husband actually mentioned it the other day he said yeah he said you don't watch much tv now I mean I'm I'm sure you know there are things that I like but generally I just think I just haven't got that pull um so that that yeah so I'd not, noticed that uh, which was interesting we're a strange Although culture you know a lot most of us now have grown up with television and, and if you had to spend evening after evening in the living room with no tv a lot of people get very fidgety and don't know what to do with themselves that they, they hate yes. hate not having a tv there you know but I don't think anyone on their deathbed thinks oh I wished I watched more TV you know <laughs> and, and for me I I seem to have absolutely no part of me interested in political shenanigans at all so again when I, um, I, I just had that for some people that's obviously is their vocation is to be very much involved in and that and get enthused and passionate about what people are doing but for me it's just like yeah and 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 I did sort of question myself I thought oh Debbie is that because you don't care about humanity and I thought no I probably never cared more I just like loving history and seeing so many cycles of leaders and things coming and going and I just think I'll leave that to the people who's who are passionate about it you know just just tell me a few headlines from time to time and that's enough for me and I would rather focus on my own contribution um because that's all I can do um in the most part but yeah everyone's here for a different purpose i think aren't they oh what a lovely cat elizabeth that's lovely everyone's here for their vocation yeah yes she really liked this mana i mean she was well, you know what mana she my cat was like really listening to you <laughs> you know what? mana knows my my close friend christy right so <laughs> So we have a cat connection. Yeah. <laughs> that was brilliant. I mean, that was so good. I'm so glad that it that it was changed because I wasn't able to watch whenever it didn't work. <laughs> so yeah. I'm grateful for that because this was fantastic. And I look forward to the tree gung because, you know, th this, this man's teaching some kind of qigong i don't know it's like it was real it's very good like to get your upper because you know i walk a lot but that doesn't really get your posture or anything like like the upper like moving that we do lots of movements with the i don't know it's it's a um I think it's like to chop heads off but he's very he's really very together and he doesn't do it but it's it's good. I guess it's a martial arts kind of Tai Chi. I don't know, but it, but it really works the, the heart. Right? Yeah. Well, I found for me, since I was diagnosed and I've been sick over these past three years, I I've had to stop everything that I really loved doing aside from gardening. I'm so grateful that on good days I'm able to be in my garden but you know I was a dancer and a writer and a ritualist and an actress and I taught I interpreted for the deaf I did so many different things but because of the type of cancer that I've had I have which is in my middle cauldron area by the way um, I've come. I've come to this point where I feel like my vocation is staying alive, and it's not enough for me. 
So the fact that you're going to be offering more trigang is what I'm understanding. I really feel like that will, will help me find out, you know, just how am I supposed to taper my passions and my vocation to carry on because when you're really ill with something that you know is going to end your life, your priorities and the way you see things and what you do changes as well. But really your purpose, your vocation, it, I, don't, I don't know. I think somehow maybe it's still there. It's just changed in some way and I, and I want to find it again. So it's I hope a, you do that. It's eternal. No. Nope. But um, the, the troubled mind can disconnect you from from it, you know. So you're in such a you're such a warrior, manner. It, it's amazing the life you've had. Yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, even with your illness, you've got to try and find half an hour or an hour each day just to do what you love. Just because just give yourself those positive vibes as an hour's medicine every day. And the trees are the healers, right? It's like hugging a tree. I was walking and there's such a beautiful halfway of this loop that I walked. There's this fantastic uh, juniper tree, you know, here in Sedona. And, and I just stop it hugging the tree. They're so healing, aren't they? Because I was walking with my friend who was like going on and on about all the, I mean, she, it's, she's been with her partner for four years who is dealing with cancer and I can just see it's draining her. And I was like, just hug this tree. Like, you know, the trees, they truly are our healers. It was so interesting because I was in Southern California and there's so many palm trees. You know, I was, because I grew up there, the palm trees, but they're not very huggy trees, kind of, but I was looking at the, their unusual trees. Yeah, That's what I, I, hadn't, I, I was really noticing in that this time. Palm all, trees. Yeah, all trees are chi generators. They, yeah. they, they generate life force. That's what they do, you know. So you know, this is why okay. the Chinese go and do qigong under a tree every morning. That's, that's normal stuff, you know. There's, there's that book called Finding the Mother Tree. I'm sure many of you probably have read it. Um, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I can't remember the name of the author. But I really enjoyed it because she talks about the mycelium in the earth and how the trees all are interconnected with all the plants and the grass and all the vegetation and that they all know and have a sense in this area where they are what each other needs. So she says in this book that if you walk barefoot in your yard or in your sacred space, you too are, or even lay down even better, you are picking up all of that innate wisdom from the mycelium. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, I always liked, I was like laying down on my back in the forest anyways, even when I was a little kid. Now they call it forest bathing, but, you know, I don't think you can get enough of it. And um, I don't know why that came into my head, but it did. <laughs> I, I think nature and the trees, they really help you connect with your middle cauldron. I, I really do. You know, an hour in the woods, your brain stops worrying about your everyday bills and everything, doesn't it? You know, for a little while and you're just in a wholesome environment. Yeah, um, my vocation is to bring people to, um, yeah, to that idea of, uh, finding the connection to themselves by nature and so today I had a herbal excursion where I 
um, showed people the herbs that are growing at the moment and what they are for and so on. And sometimes the, the horses just galop with me and I tell them what I really think is important about nature, not uh, to take this herb for your throat and that herb for whatever. Uh, and so today I really told them again that we are so similar to the trees that they are really our relatives, our standing brothers and sisters, and that we really should um, make a deeper connection with them and uh, hook them and stand with them. And uh, because the brain is full of, uh, if you if you watch it, it's full of the synapses and it looks like a tree. So it's, it's just... Um, um like the, the top of the tree and when we are well rooted uh we feel better than uh when we are uh always running around and and they were watching me somewhere watching me quite astonished but in the end they i think they believed me and i love um uh, bringing this little blink this little flame to 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 life again and all these because it's just i'm just a reminder i i'm i i think my, one of my vocations is to remind them of this core uh, secret and i'm deeply convinced that everybody has uh, a, a tree that fits the, the best but uh every tree is just beautiful to to come, to, to come back to this um, I am feeling this I am entity and this and this the the idea just to, to return to the I am and this is it nothing more than just I am and yeah this is one of my vocations and I'm still uh, searching for the best way to bring it to the people to bring it even to people who might not have ever thought about it uh, just to open the door a bit and to make them curious about what's, what there is to mm. discover ultimately it's love isn't it yeah. love, to, love to help others love to make the world a better place Mm. yes that's what the yeah. heart does mm. yeah and, and the I'm heart, sure the heart wants you to be happy so that you function properly yes yeah. Yeah. and when you know who you are and when you know your vocation and when you are connected to your center to your heart you wouldn't dare harming anybody any longer because you just know that you are harming yourself in the same time when you're uh, harming others. Yeah. That was brings us to uh, Branwyn, Branwyn, the daughter of Lear, and the tremendous tragedy that that we visited in the Alder view. Mm -hmm. That this is this is not an uplifting story. It's a Titanic tragedy, but it's a tremendous lesson about our human condition on earth and the fact that we are um, faced with tragedy and loss and, and um, twisted uh, narcissistic wounding that mm. is part of our human condition. And I think that that's the gist of the story. And I, I would make a, you know, a pitch to to, to you know, pick up the voices of the Grove Three and and uh, <laughs> take a deep dive into my article, which is quite quite uh, maybe a challenging read, but I think I think it has some good ideas there that are um, relevant to um, what we're dealing with in in the Middle Cauldron. What is it to read? What? It's it's an article that I wrote for Voices of the Grove, Volume Three. And it's called Branwyn, the Daughter of Lear. And uh, I think it was the archetypal imagination, something like that. But it's a, it's a very you, long arc. Of the Grove, OK. Yeah, this is Yuri's, uh, you know, third, third book mm -hmm. in, in, in the 
the addition that he's putting together for this group. Frankly, and I was just looking at two lines in the first poem that I read. And the first line says that, you know, the, the middle cauldron, you know, it's on, it's on its side. And the line says um, that it is overturned by joy. Mm -hmm. But then the next line says it manifests through sorrow. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, like with youth, especially teenagers and, and young people, they're just loving life and uh, ignorance is bliss and, and all the rest of it. But it's actually when you take a punch of a sorrow that you actually feel it and you become aware of, of how broken you are inside, you know. So a lot of people are ignorant of their middle cauldron until sorrow breaks their heart and then life changes doesn't it you know and and it's often that heartbreak that creates artwork and poetry and song and and, and all the rest of it and stuff so that it manifests yeah. through sorrow Thank but you. joy that's turns it upright yeah that's such an important point and, and it's such an enlightening point if we can find how sorrow fits into the world and that it's not just some personal perverse cross we're bearing but this is the human condition mm -hmm. and, and then we can take our sorrow and with art and creativity we can elevate it up onto the tapestry of life and it just it just this is the way to heal ourselves of it right it's to to see that this is the human condition this is not just mine and then when we give it to the world right that that's a, an opportunity of immortality right because there are poets that are thousands of years old that were still amazed by what they have shared with us and they've immortalized this quality of their heart that that is still touching us i heard a lovely song yesterday and one of the lines in there was about and your your tears are joy finally coming home and i thought oh that very much fits in um to a lot of the sentiments that we've had tonight mm -hmm. There's a, a lovely song that I would encourage you all to go and listen to. It's called Every December Sky, and it's sung by uh, Beth Nielsen Chapman. Oh, yeah. And it has an amazing line in it about the heart, and it's a lovely paradox. It says, how heavy is the empty heart, and how light is the heart that's full. It's just oh. it's a brilliant middle cauldron thing, you know. So, yeah, look look for Every December Sky by Beth Nielsen Chapman. Mm. It's all about the middle cauldron. You know, mm. How heavy is the empty heart? And, and I have another, another beautiful idea. So the, the cauldron is uh, turned upright when, when it's filled with joy. And then we have another thing. As soon as you have... Um, gone through sorrow and pain um, you are able afterwards you are able or during going going through pain you are able to feel empathy so because you you and this is I think empathy is also a very important key for the uh, middle cauldron which results from um, from pain and joy in fact the two of them so that you can you can feel empathy and you can still smile and have a heart full of joy uh, in the face of sorrow in fact so mm. Mm. well it's all ours whether it's good or bad it's what we got <laughs> it's like a slab of Play. you get what you get and you make it beautiful and or you don't you know but it's yours it's like it's like for me i feel like when i go to this to the spirit world or the other world or the summer lands which is what i like to call it you know there's no good or bad it's just it just is and i think nature kind of tells us that too you know it's but but survive as a human and to, to find that balance is, is to understand these three cauldrons and to uh, utilize them and nurture them and 
one of my grandfathers uh, was the hereditary chief of the Klamath Nation, and he said, the most important thing is to keep your baskets well pitched so that the water doesn't fall through them and that they can contain what you need in your life. So. On that note, let's bring it to a close. So we're 20 minutes over. So thank you, everybody. Thank and, um, you. Thank I'll, you. I'll download it now and put it onto YouTube so you can listen to the poetry again, make sense of it as you do. So best wishes. My hands are disappearing. Yeah. Bye, everybody.